do you want to trade or do you want to make money? And if you yeah. if your goal is to make money, then you should be making decisions based on making money as opposed to uh, playing a video game. And too too many people do approach understandably. I mean, the way it looks, it's like a video game. But too many people yeah. approach it as though it's a video game instead of a, a business. And you can't. I mean, you can re up on credits, but credits is, is real money in this case. And so you have to, you know, your desire to be involved has to be less than your desire to make a profit year end. This episode of The Speculators Podcast is sponsored by Jigsaw Trading. Jigsaw Trading is an industry leader when it comes to order flow tools, training, and equipping traders to make better trade decisions. And if you've ever been trading and just feel a little lost and feel like you're missing something, and maybe you've been drawn to order flow, and intuitively, you know that it's important and that you should be learning this, but it's just a little overwhelming because of how it moves and because of the numbers and you don't really know where to start, I get it, but you need to check out Jigsaw Trading. On a personal level, my first exposure into order flow and the idea that this is important came directly from Peter Davies, the founder of Jigsaw Trading. And even through to today, most of what I do with order flow and my thoughts around it came directly from Jigsaw. We're gonna have more to say about Jigsaw later in the episode, and I'm gonna give you some direction on how you can access free order flow training starting as soon as today. But for now, Let's get started with today's episode. I'm very glad that you're here. I hope you get something from today's conversation and a big thank you to Jigsaw for sponsoring the episode. Let's begin. Mr. Grady, welcome back to the channel. It's so good to see you again. How are you? I am well, how are you? I'm doing well. You actually, you're looking great. The last time we talked, uh, you're just so much more clean cut. You, you actually takes years <laughs> off of you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, that was intentional today. I realized I was watching the last video and, you know, you caught me last year. I was in the mountain bike boat and uh, uh -huh. I realized I should probably clean up, put in the contacts and uh, look a little more professional this time. Oh, I tell you, it's uh, information it's was too good. It's just a better appearance. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Definitely. Well, I'll tell you what, um, you know, the last time we did talk, you were doing some, I think, seasonal traveling. Um, where are you at now? Yeah, I travel a lot. I'm actually in Los Angeles right now. Um, yeah, I just kind of, I don't live on the road per se, but I like to do quite a bit of traveling and, uh, I have friends all over the country. So yeah, I'll usually spend this time of year in California, the summer in the mountains, and then, uh, winter in Florida. Yeah. Very good. You got that gypsy blood in you then. Yeah, pretty much. Well, I'm currently in India, so you're preaching to the choir. If you want to talk about that gypsy blood. <laughs> wow. Uh, all right. I'm all aboard with that. Um, but yeah, very good to have you back on the channel. And I know that um, the last time that we spoke, it has been quite a while. So maybe just as an opening thought here, since the last time we talked, which has been, I think, a couple of years ago, um, you know, at least a good year or so, what what have you been up to primarily? Any any kind of new focus or new interest or anything um, new going on? Or what have you been focused on primarily? I mean, not really, man. I just kind of live life, um, you know, I trade and and travel and just kind of like, I mean, I guess like you're doing if you're in India right now, I'm assuming. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't, I can't complain. Really good. I have it pretty, pretty good overall. So do what I, I do. That. I, I yeah. tell you, are you traveling? Um, do you ever travel outside the U S or are you pretty much like yeah. a, a Spain U S side? Yeah, no, I, I did a lot um, a while back. I did like a whole around the world tour type thing. And, okay. um, then the COVID stuff, you know, hit. And so when that hit, I just, I started, decided to stay in the U.S. for a couple of years and just went and driving around, hitting the mountains, mountain biking and stuff. But yeah, prior to that, yeah. I've been to a lot of countries in Europe, um, been to Japan and a couple other places. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan. I have not been to India. So I hear, I hear oh, it's very, very busy. Good. What part are you in? I'll tell you, I'm doing just a quick week in New Delhi and then I'm going north to, uh, tap into some, uh, you know, get the crack open the third eye and get the, get the juices flowing. So I'll I be up see. there for about a month and then I'm going to head, um, I got one more week. So I'll be in six weeks total, but you're not wrong. Uh, here in New Delhi, 
this is one of the most chaotic places I've ever been. <laughs> it is just walking out in public is a, is a proper adventure. So <laughs> it's an interesting place for sure. But That's I'll tell right. you, it's almost like I'm uh, talking to, you know, looking in the mirror here, just a few years down the road for myself, because I, I, yeah, I'm currently on a bit of a um, you know, around the world tour myself. And I'll plan on going back to the States and probably being a lot more uh, mobile, but stateside mobile after I kind of, you know, get all this out of me. Right. It's a good way to do it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I have some years on you, so I, I speak from experience. Uh, are you going to go up to like Nepal or Bhutan while you're there or no? Um, no. <clears throat> as far as India goes, it'll just be New Delhi, uh, Rishka, something, and then Bangalore. Okay. Which is right. actually quite a bit. Normally, wherever I go, I'm kind of just doing one city. Um, right. and it, because other than vacation, I am, and it's incredibly chaotic to just get dropped off somewhere, especially if you don't know the language or if the city is uniquely chaotic. Right. And um, right. I found one month to kind of be that sweet spot where I can get in there. The first week is just chaos. You kind of get a little bit of the lay of land. You start getting a little bit settled in. Then you have a few weeks of uh, having some order and then being able to, you know, do it all over again. And um, right. I, I used to drive myself crazy trying to see too much. And then you just had to, okay, listen. Pick a place, make yourself a little bit at home, and then just make it sustainable. It's a good way to go about it. Yeah, when I when I leave the country, I like to leave for at least two or three weeks to to try to give as much in as possible. And then occasionally yeah. I'll do like two or three days somewhere, but I try to do one at least a week somewhere so you get a feel for the culture and the people and everything else, and you're not rushing yeah, yourself. You yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That's cool, now, man. I also know that the last time we talked. Um, it was very, you know, we covered a lot of surface stuff, I think, uh, necessary at some level, just understanding some more of your story, kind of your path into trading, what you're focused on and your style, maybe some routines, things like this. Um, and again, at some level, I think necessary, but I'm sure a waste of your talent. So I'm very excited that you're back. And, um, I really look forward to the conversation today, being able to take things a little bit deeper. And maybe, um, you know, spend some time on a couple topics that I think are very important that we can just explore, maybe banter back and forth around a bit. And maybe by way of introducing this, uh, maybe setting the tone here even, I think that when it comes to trading, there's the general path of, of very noisy, a lot of information, a lot of things to focus on, and very little of the things that we could focus on are important. It's a little bit fugazi to where if you do get these things right, you can still never make money in trading. Um, and then there are a few topics that if you get these things right, they do make up for a multitude of sins. And these topics stay very surface. Um, and then we kind of just broaden out and learn a lot of things in trading. But there's a few topics I think that if we just kept talking about them, you know, take them from knowing it up here to where we really know these things and they can make some change, um, these are really impactful. And these are the things that are, are going to push the needle and lead to some results. Um, and maybe a, a, another way to say this, just not to get too long on the, the monologue here, but I think if we reference the good book, go back to the Bible, the Bible talks about Pharisees and the Pharisees were these religious people that were just so into being religious that they totally missed what they were doing, what it was all about. And they were so concerned about the letter of the law that they missed the spirit of the law, very religious, but they missed the whole purpose of everything. And I think that this is the path of most traders where so caught up in trading and all these things that have to do with trading that it gets missed of what is actually important here. What is the job? What are the things that we should be focusing on? And I guess with that as a bit of a preface, before I even introduce anything or maybe I bring up a topic, I would really love to hear from you, um, from your perspective. There are a lot of things that people talk about and even referencing back to our last conversation, some of the surface things about, you know, your routines and, and some of your strategy and things like this. But what would be maybe a topic that you think you wish people talked about more, you wish people would go deeper on instead of saying surface on any topics like this that just jump out to you? Yeah, it's the idea of game theory. And, yeah. and I can elaborate on this briefly, but get to the point so that people understand I'm not just rambling about nothing. I recently read this post that was on uh, one of the forums and it was just, it was a, a retail guy. He's you know been around a little bit and he said, you know, I keep reading about mindset, mindset, how important mindset is for trading. And he goes, it just doesn't seem like that's really true because it doesn't matter what kind of mindset you have. If you don't, if you don't know what you're doing or the system isn't working, but the mindset you have isn't going to make any difference. And then he just throws it out there for people to respond to that. And I was, 
I had didn't respond, but I was thinking about it for this interview. He's absolutely right. It doesn't matter what kind of mindset you have if you don't know what you're doing, right? So if, if you don't know how to play chess, you can have the greatest mindset in the world. You're not going to be somebody who knows how to play chess, right? If you're if you step in the ring with a boxer and you don't know how to box, you're going to get knocked out no matter what your mindset is. So the core, what I would start today with, would be the fundamental driving force of trading is why are you buying, why are you selling, and what's the game at play, right? So if you buy at 10, it's only because you think someone's going to buy at 11. And the question is, why do you think they're going to buy it? There's something that uh, you, you will hear in the poker world called GTO, which means game theory optimal, right? Yes. So to apply that to trading, the idea would be if you're buying at 10, you're only buying at 10 because someone else, is, you think someone's going to buy at 11 and pay a higher price, than you, right? If you sell at 10, you think someone else is going to sell at nine and, and be willing to sell at a lower price than you. So you go short, right? So the question becomes, <clears throat> why do you think that? And this really is where everybody falls down um, in the retail world because they don't truly understand what's happening. So I'm going to give you a quick um, broad example of this. Recently, Bill Ackerman, he's the guy that has a hedge fund. He was telling a story on a podcast of uh, he had shorted a stock called Herbalife. It was like a multi-level yeah. marketing thing back in the day. And he had beef with Carl Icahn, who was you know a billionaire at the time. And so the short of the saga, and he explains it on this, this podcast recently, is that Carl Icahn used his money and his power and his persuasion, media and everything else, to buy Herbalife, large blocks of it, and then create a media frenzy around it and pump the price higher. And you squeeze Ackerman's fund. And Ackerman eventually had to sell for a billion dollar loss, right? Um, point to that being, one man was able to create a move in a stock to do a short squeeze and squeeze a fund out of a billion dollars, not to mention anybody else who may have been short on the stock as well, right? Obviously, the GameStop, GameStop saga was a little bit different than that. But the, the point to that is that kind of maneuvering happens on a daily basis and it doesn't happen all day every day but you have these major market making firms like citadel for example goldman Sachs, those are the ones that people know you also have drw you have optiver and people can research this like on their own time um the definition of being a market maker is you make a market so the, one of the reasons i tell people to look at their depth of market right the order book instead of the charts is so that you can see the bids and the offers in the book and you can see what the volume sort of is and that and it changes but all of those orders so when you flip on your screen in the morning and you open up a depth of market for let's just say the es you'll see orders on the bids orders on the offers right like 10 levels or 20 levels deep and none of those orders are your orders right so who's working those orders well those are typically mostly market making so these guys have orders working on the bids and the offers all day long. And, and then the amount of volume they're working and the prices that they're working will change with what's happening in the market. And so they have a massive advantage because they're trading. They're, they're literally doing thousands of trades a day. And they're, they're not just trading the ES. They're trading the ES, the NASDAQ futures, the Dow futures. They're trading dozens, if not hundreds of stocks and ETFs, and then they're trading the options on all of those stocks and ETFs, and they're probably also trading crude and metals as well on top of this. And so it's reached a point where a massive firm that has, you know, $20 billion that they can play with can read what's going on all over the board, right? And so they have information that you and I don't have is the point of this. Mm -hmm. And then they also have a ton of money and money can move the market. That's just the reality. Now there's certain scenarios where, you know, kind of everyone does the same way at the same time. 
And when that happens, they don't try to fight it. They might get run over a little bit, but then usually they're adjusting their positions across the board and maybe reversing going the other way, <laughs> and it just feeds on itself. But when I, the reason I explain this is because if you want to be consistent, and that's where this really comes down, for consistently making money as a day trader, you have to understand this concept and be able to sort of understand how these players maneuver and the reason I understand that is because I worked for a couple of prop firms in my day. That's why I know this. So if you've actually been in a room trading a lot of size yourself, or you've seen traders put up, you know, a thousand contracts in 10 year notes, let's say, and then you see price move as a result of that, you witness it firsthand and you go, oh, okay, I see. So spoofing is illegal because spoofing works. That's just the reality. But the problem is that spoofing still happens every day. It just happens in the form where it's kind of a gray area. And the average person who's looking at a chart, let's say, and, it, and all he sees is the green bar, the red bar, and price, right? Let me tell you what he doesn't see. This is all going somewhere. If you were to watch the 10-year treasury note, you can see this in the ES2. It just happens faster. But the 10-year treasury note futures, there will be 2,000 contracts showing on the bid. Right. And then that 2000 may get hit like 100 contracts trades into it. And then the 2000 suddenly drops down to about 800. So 100 contracts trade, but then do you know, another 1100 cancel. And then a few more hundred trade and the rest cancel. So even though there were 2000 on the bid, when it actually trades, maybe only five or 600 trade and all the other orders cancel. You know, the definition of whether that's a spoof or not is going to be dependent upon how long the order was working and whatnot. But so a lot of what these guys are doing is just layering quotes. But then when price actually gets to their quote, they cancel their order with no intention of actually executing. So this creates a situation whereby a market maker might be working bids and it makes the market look kind of strong. And then as soon as price gets there, they cancel the next three or four bids underneath and the price drops very easily as a result of that. Or they don't cancel their bids and they keep refreshing their bids and they hold prices with their volume. So as a retail trader, you have to be aware of this and know that it influences price. And you can see the same thing in the ES sometimes. It actually helps to watch other stocks in ETS as well, like watch the volume trading and other, other stuff. But you can see in the ES sometimes when there's, you know, 150 on the bid and then 10 or 20 contracts trade and then it just drops down to like 20 contracts and then 20 more trade and it goes lower. So a lot of the orders cancel and then this acts as a magnet. And then if bids keep pulling away like that, price keeps going lower very easily. So this is why you have volatility. So you have more volatility in general when there's less volume on the bid ask. Right. So if it if it takes a thousand contracts to get through a bid, it takes a lot more money than if it only takes a hundred contracts to get through a bid or an offer. Mm -hmm. And so the average person, you know, I'm trying not to ramble too much here, but you're missing out on that information if you're not watching the order book. And and then it comes down a bit more to also just understanding price action and context. So there are certain moments when everybody kind of is thinking the same thing, including the big firms. And so they all go the same way at the same time. And then you, cre you it creates a domino effect, right? So I buy, which triggers price to the next price. And then you're like, oh, going higher. And then you buy. And then three market makers buy. And then guys who were short have to now buy to cover their short trades. And you have all these HFT programs that are feeding, and it feeds on itself, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when you get the major follow through. So the moves where they, you know, maybe the ES runs 10, 12 points very easily is when that's happening. And then the other situations this morning is a great example of that. They moved a little bit lower off the open and then a ton of contracts traded. Right? Like today is March 13th for anybody who watched this after the fight. Ton of contracts trade around 52, 33, 34 in the ES futures. And it's still hanging towards lows, but it's not going. Right. And finally, it breaks down to about 28, 29, and it hits a bunch more contracts and then it starts rolling back. 
And then it rolls back through 33, goes back up to like 37, and then like back down to 33, 33, 34 again. So the context today, pretty much from the open, is a lot of volume was trading in a tighter area. So so even if you're short on that, when they break the lows, when it doesn't go very far and you see it rolling back, there's no point in holding a trade in this situation. Mm -hmm. This is where it dials into like the meat and potatoes section of it. You know, and so a lot of people, they get into the systems trading and they think I have to risk three points to make seven points, or, I ha or I have to follow the, you know, follow the system or whatever. It has it needs to be very reactive, just like if you're in a fight, just like you're a professional athlete, you're a football player on the field. The quarterback calls a snap. He reads the field. He's planning on throwing to the, you know, the receiver on the right. That guy's too well covered. He has to call an audible in his brain, go to the left, throw that way. Right. He's reacting to the moment. So traders too often aren't reacting in the moment. They they have an idea that they've, they've got to be going for the five or 10 or 12 point run in the ES, let's just say, rather than acknowledging that there's too much volume going back and forth. And it's just very unlikely that's going to happen. So if that's the situation, you have to go for the smaller wins or possibly if it's if it's too much back and forth, just avoid it altogether. And in the this morning is a little bit, at least it's more conducive to my style because there is volume that pushes, so you get a little more read for the short term pushes. But when it's really thin in the book, that's when you kind of like last Friday morning. There were some good moves last Friday, but a lot of last Friday was this nasty back and forth whipsaw. So it would dive, and if you sold it immediately, it would snap back and go straight higher. And it's this. Um, situation that exists because the market makers aren't willing to work a lot of volume. They're working less volume. And so you get kind of sucked in and you hit bids. And as soon as those bids get filled, they try to run it back the other way. And it really is a trap. Like it's not, this isn't theoretical. Like there, there are situations where the bigger players set traps and they, they actually pull their bids. They let the market fall. And then when they get their bids filled at lower prices, they start buying rapidly to shoot price up. And you can see this in the NASDAQ a lot. And they shoot it back up, hoping to, to, to squeeze all the programs that just got short. And then they cover those offers, and you just see it go back and forth. And in that scenario, it's very difficult to make money because um, you just get whipsawed back and forth. And then if you, about the time you decide you want to commit to, to one way or the other for the next 30 minutes, you're on the wrong side. And that's when it goes against you. Like big time goes against yeah. you. Everybody knows this. Everybody's been in those situations that you've been trading for a few weeks, usually. So, <clears throat> assessing the game theory element of it and understanding that that it is a game is very much a poker game. And you're up against big firms that have billions of dollars at their disposal. You have to be selective about not. You have to be selective about the number of trades you take. It's a, it's about the situation. So if the situation is good and the market is ebbing and flowing and there's follow through, <clears throat> you can take 20 trades a day. I mean, it, it may be there, but there are other situations when if you realize every time you're thinking long, it drops and every time you're thinking short, it goes higher. Just stop. You know, the, the, it's not that you're, you're, it's not that you're unintelligent or you, or there should be some way for you to, to take advantage of that. Is that you're just in a in a scenario where the market makers have complete control, and it's going to be really difficult for anyone to make money in that situation if you're not a big player. So you just try to stay out and preserve your capital for better situations, and that's really number one. Man, I mean, you can you can learn discipline mm -hmm. and, and not you know throwing your money away once you realize you're on the wrong side and all this, but if you don't understand the very fundamentals of that, you're going to struggle. I mean, sure, you can have a day or two here and there where you, you have a good run because you catch a one-way street, right? But then people usually give it all back over the next two or three days when it's kind of choppy or they get whipsawed. It breaks low, they sell it, it eventually comes right back into the range, things like that, right? So you have to become proficient at anticipating what type of situation it is it, or seems to be. And sometimes you get lucky. I mean, like last Friday, it was it was obvious at one point 
they were probably going to break and I got short and then it just disintegrated, which is wonderful when that happens, you know, you just keep hitting it as long as it's falling, but it's kind of a gift when those things happen. It's not, it's not that you can predict that the ES is about to drop 20 points or whatever. It's just you're on board for the ride and you try to stay on board until it hits some volume and finally stops. Um, but those gifts don't come along that frequently, you know? So you try to press that for all the sports can happen. And then there are other days you try to make, you know, some moves and maybe some readable back and forth. And then there are going to be other days or other times when you just, it, it's almost impossible. Um, and it, and it, typically like if you've made three or four trades and you're not up, you're probably either, you're either, off your game, maybe, but probably it's just conditions. It's just, mm -hmm. if you look at it, it wouldn't have mattered which way you went. The market's still trading the same place at 1030 as it was at 930, you know, or at 11 as it was at 10. And that's a sign that they're just going back and forth. So that's okay, where before, I would start. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. And I think before we unpack anything about, let's say, this uh, – optimal situation and, and even into the game theory. It's, it's funny. You're the second person I've talked to today that's really pooed pooed trading psychology. And um, I also very much agree with this, where I think the probably the most thing that I'm approached about is, you know, somebody who has seen these spurts of um, some progress or some winning trades and they, you know, are doing crazy things and they, they really think that it's just their mindset and they're struggling with, all this anxiety about should I enter here or should I take this trade off? And I took this trade off and then it zoomed up. If I just had the mental strength to hold on longer and really discounting what a skill this is to where you are feeling all of these crazy emotions because you are in, as you described, this very dangerous environment that we at some level um, are not prepared to win consistently because we are up against people that are smarter than us, more powerful than us, have better resources than us. And you are stepping into this environment, kind of a financial war, and you are not prepared. So of course you're feeling all sorts of crazy, you know, things. And at some level, those are good things because it's your, you know, probably your natural biology telling you that, hey, be careful, this is not good. And trying to just sit here and work on this all day isn't going to make up for a lack of actual skill. Um, and of course, I think there is, the, you know, an obvious balance to where having the right mindset and having that competitive mindset and having a resilient mindset, like these are things to have. You can't be super soft and you, you can't, you know, be fragile in your mind to make it in this environment. Um, but it definitely gets way too much put on it. And um, it's just interesting how much this is coming up recently this week for me. Um, and, and I think this is something we can keep talking about to kind of recap some of the things you said here. Because this to me is a very interesting topic and it, it covers quite a few, there's a few ways to go with this. But what we've what you've outlined here is the idea that okay, we're playing this game. And inside of this game, the the person that we're playing against, maybe just for simplicity, let's say it's the market. Um, and in this game, we have to have some humility to understand that we cannot be right all the time. And we cannot in every environment just walk in and expect to make money. And there has to be a sense of humility of just understanding. We are, in the grand scheme of things, undercapitalized. We are underinformed. We are, like, these are real. These things, you know, the people right. we're competing against have these things on us. And so you talked about um, a few things. The first one I'd maybe like to circle back around to is being able to react in the moment. And in this world of trading, there's just this fine line between having that skill to understand what you're seeing and then be able to act on it not getting married to the idea that, hey, my moving average cross and I have to hold for a two to one risk to reward. So I'm just going to sit on my hands and, you know, and right. hope that somehow that turns into an edge over time. But being able to have that skill set to read what is happening and understand why I'm in this trade, what I'm expecting to see happen, when what I'm expecting to see happen is not working and why it's not working, and then make a decision the same way if you are in a fight. You can't just say, well, I learned these three combos and whatever the person on the other side is doing to me, I'm just going to keep throwing these three combos and every once in a while they're going to hit. And then all the other times I'm just going to keep getting knocked out. Right. Um, so this is part of our skill set. So maybe give some thoughts on this, on that difference between uh, trading from your gut and just making emotional decisions and the actual making a reactive decision or a responsive decision to what's going on and an, an intelligent decision um, maybe say a few words about this. And if you have any thoughts on 
what somebody can do to build that skill set to where they're they're more responding correctly to what's happening and not just like reacting out of emotion. Let's take a quick break from today's episode because I need to ask you a very important question. Have you ever been trading, maybe up against the hard right edge of the screen, and you find yourself maybe coming off of a loss and thinking thoughts, thoughts like, what is going on? I'm confused. I don't get it. You ever think those kind of thoughts? Of course you have, because you're not using today's video sponsor, Jigsaw Trading. Jigsaw Trading provides institutional grade tools, education, and insights to help traders make better decisions. And it's no secret that the best traders in the world are using order flow, sometimes exclusively, but they're using it at some level. And if you don't understand order flow, and if you don't have the tools to see it, you're just missing an important piece of information, full stop. Jigsaw Trading is the real deal when it comes to equipping traders with the tools and education to trade like pros. And I'm talking about their award-winning trading platform called Day Trader. This is going to give you elite level order flow analysis, custom charts, automated trading analytics, and it was built based on techniques actually used by institutional traders to give you clarity into market movement. And that's just one part of the package. They also have journalytics, the most advanced journaling and analytic system that is going to track your progress and help you identify your weaknesses. They also go beyond tools and resources with step-by-step -step video courses and drills designed by real professionals to shortcut your learning curve dramatically. So whether you're a seasoned pro or brand new to the screens, Jigsaw Trading is going to have something for you. Oh, and did I forget to mention that they're giving away a free order flow training right now. All you're gonna have to do is click the link below and it's gonna take you to a free order flow training where you can see what Jigsaw is all about for yourself. A big thank you to Jigsaw for sponsoring this episode. Make sure you check out their free video training. Now let's get back to the episode. Right, so that would come, I'm glad you brought this up, Austin, to discuss this. So it is, the reality is that most people get into this because they want to make six figures from their bedroom, right? It's not that they really want yeah. to be a day trader. It's that they don't really want to learn the skill of day trading. They just want to make money from home, right? Yeah. And there are easier ways to make money from home than day trading, let me tell you what. Uh, but you know, it can be done. And But to your point, you do have to learn the game itself, right? And so... Mostly what it comes down to is a lot of screen time and and getting a, a I mean, it is, it's not, it's what I call acquired intuition, like also with fighting or, or athletes, or athletics, whatever. You kind of watch and watch and watch day after day. And you start to see that a certain amount of volume is trading. The market tends to be choppy. A certain amount of trades it tends to maybe have follow through on breakouts or highs or lows, these types of things. Mm -hmm. And so after a while, I'll give you a good example. It happened recently when I was working with somebody. It was early morning and the the NASDAQ and the ES are kind of doing the same thing, like pre-930, the futures. And the NASDAQ just sort of tanked towards the lows. And as it was dropping, you know, I was like, ah, that's probably going to go. And the ES is probably going to fall. And so I, I short the ES real fast. And they do both go. But in that particular scenario, I know that it might be really short lived because it's what, like 8.45 or 8.50 a.m., something like that. And it's one of those days where they might crack lows. And then as soon as the again, like as soon as the market makers get hit on all their bids below the low, they just rock, rocket it back the other way. You know, so and people don't understand that. So basically what happens is in this, in this type of situation is that a, a institution or multiples, whatever, multiple institutions would work bids below the overnight low, all right? They're already there. But so let's, let's say the overnight low is it's 10, okay? They're already working bids at eight, seven, six, five, and four. And then they sell 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. So the bids are already below the low and they go in and they try to see if they can hit enough to create a domino effect to trigger stop sales below the overnight low. If they do, if they're successful and they don't run into some other heavy hitter, that's maybe on the buy side and he stops it, which that happens too. But if they're successful and they trigger the stop sales, 
So all the stop sales get set off by, you know, like retail or smaller firms. The firm that just sold between 15 and 10 is now covering between eight and four, let's say. And then they start buying back through 10, 11, 12 and start trying to squeeze the other way and traffic way they just went short at new lows, right? So point being, I already know that in this environment, that time of morning was not super busy, not like a number, there was no economic data, no you know payrolls or whatever. It might reverse quite quickly. So I hit the short, they both go, they both stop and the NASDAQ rockets right back off my screen to the high side and the ES rolls back and I just click out immediately and I'm you know I made like a one take it didn't matter with make two lose two whatever it was the point is when they rock it back like that there's no way I'm pulling the trick because I already know like I'll oh, probably a trap and I click out and it was the right play didn't reverse could have made the argument for that but it was pretty choppy point being the ES shot back up you know four five four his NASDAQ shot back up so the read on NASDAQ is breaking lows. ES is probably going to follow. I'm going to go short. Is a valid read. But as soon as it reverses like that in that type of a context, in that situation, I'm out. There's no point, like you said, in waiting for the moving averages or the trend lines or, or, any, or halving. There's no point in it. Just react in the moment to what you're seeing. But in order to react, you already have to have some idea of what you're going to see. Right? Mm -hmm. So... If that's your first experience with that, you're going to get run over. That's fine. That's how you learn. But after after you set through, you know, a couple dozen mornings like that, maybe over a few months, you should start to pick up on the fact that that's not an uncommon occurrence. So you need to tread very carefully selling new lows or buying new highs at that time of day and, and maybe not let those trades roll back on you. You know, like if it moves in your favor right away, you lock in a, a break even at worst and then see if it, you know, maybe give it a little room. So that's part of it is you just have to, again, you already have to know how to counter, right? Going back to the fighting, like it, it, sure you have, you know, you know, you maybe you throw a really good jab or whatever, jab, uppercut, but there are going to be times when you have to learn how to throw body shots. That's the only way you can get to the guy on body shots because you, can, you just can't get him in the face. So with trading, you have to sort of a similar thing. You got to figure out you can't always just go long or short and wait for the 10-point run because you're not going to get them that often. It, it, the market's in the range too much. And I'll tell you, this reminds me of going back to what I said earlier about a you know skill sets that can help fix the mental issues and even the idea of being married to a trade. And you know, I'm in these trades and I'm just getting too married to them. Well, if you have that skill set of understanding exactly what you're looking for and you understand what just happened, that that this is coming back, there's no reason to be married to it. Married to it is is you know a kind of a function of not really understanding what's happening. Right. Um, and right. you get that, and all of a sudden that issue solved itself. And having you just kind of walk through it was a great explanation of like a perfect example here of what we're talking about. And if that sounds, you know, if anybody's listening to this and that sounds kind of like hard to follow or you didn't quite understand that. This would be a good thing to listen to through several times. And this, honestly, this kind of a conversation here is what put me on a completely different path with my trading because I also was very indicator-based, just trying to follow indicators. And one of the first times I heard somebody talk about discretion and, and thinking through and the way that they understood what they were doing and why they were doing it, it was so different. But it was also so interesting because it made the idea now of sitting down at the screens and I'm just waiting for this thing to tell me when to get in and get out. And I'm just going to hold for this arbitrary number that's two to one or something. It just makes it like a weird thing to try to sit and just give your time to. Um, but trading becomes much more interesting and the game becomes much more uh, um, wanting to play and wanting to get good at this when you understand you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And you can make those, those types of decisions. And, you know, essentially these are the, the skills that pay the bills and not to ramble too long here, but I, I like what I even took from what you were saying there is there's no quick answer to this. This is developing a skill set that not to beat up the, the fighter analogy, no pun intended, but you can't just walk to a pro boxer and tell him like, you know, t tell me why you slipped there instead of, you know, that's something you he can't just give to you. 
you can't just get this out of a course. You can't just get this from somebody. This is something that you have to get out there and get. Nobody's going to give this to you. And if you are about this life, and if you really want to trade, um, be you know be dedicated to this. And these things come with time. And there's no absolutely no substitute for it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. There's there's no substitute for experience. It's just a matter of for people who are very serious, trying to set them on at least the right course in terms of, hey, this is what you really need to be paying attention to, you know, the watching. And um, the idea of just anticipation, right? The the reason a guy can a guy can counter or you is because he anticipates the other shot coming. You know, he anticipates that something's coming, he ducks it, he counters. So as a trader, <clears throat> too many times retail people are waiting for the momentum before they enter a trade when they need to be anticipating the momentum before it happens. So if a market is in like in that situation, if the NASDAQ is rapidly approaching lows, and I'm not saying this is always the case, but in a particular situation, I'm not waiting for it to break low before I short. I'm mm -hmm. I'm shorting as it's getting as it's going down in anticipation of it breaking and then hopefully doing what they want to do, set off stop zones. So it breaks and all these other orders hit. If I'm already short, that's how I get paid. Or that's how I at least get the look. And then if it rolls back on me, I'm at a at a break even or a very small win or small loss instead of instead of chasing and then watching it uh, become a big loss because I, I waited till the move happened. So it is it is a skill in terms of of anticipating that, and yeah, it takes a while to develop that. Um, this idea of anticipating, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I think that there's a fine line between anticipating that move that you have reason to expect, and it's well thought out, and it's an actual good decision, and just predicting, like being contrarian to what price is doing, and if the signs aren't there, and if the idea is not there but you are just predicting that this is going to break out or that this is going to, to move higher. Um, a very fine line between these two. And I think a lot of people, I, I, I'm working with a lot of people that they get this very messed up of predicting something that actually there's no reason to expect that that's going to happen. But that idea of having well thought out ideas that, that there is an edge, there is a reason to think that that is the most likely thing to happen. And then getting on uh, early enough to where if it does fail, you potentially are not even taking a loss on it. And then if you know, you're in a very good position when it does work out. Um, that's a, th I think that's a tricky balance. And I just wanted to draw some distinction to that because I, I think there's a, a very fine line there. I agree. It is a very fine line. And the entire idea behind this is can you make decisions that give you better than random results, right? It's, it's, um, is there such a thing as a high probability trade? Uh, mm -hmm. and there, there are, there is, and you can get better than random results, but yeah, it's not by in general, um, saying, I think I know where the market will be in an hour, right? Like that, that's where people really go wrong. It's, and I said this during our last, last interviews, like you asked me, I was, I was explaining something and I said, if a person is, is holding on to a trade for an hour, what does the person know that I don't know? And the answer is nothing. Usually, you know, it's it's like, OK, it's fine. You, you predicted maybe the break and now it's chopping around. Why are you still holding the trade? Well, because I think it's going higher. Well, why do you think it's going higher? And there's no no answer that would give a better than random result. It's just they hope it's going higher. So they make more money as opposed to maybe being able to actually read momentum in the moment. And so I agree. Yeah, you can't just say, oh, I think a lot of people don't even know about numbers. And I mean, I'm assuming you teach, you know, or, or talk to people about this. Just to throw it out there because it's important. Uh, like if there's a 10 a.m. number, like Michigan sentiment or new home sales or uh, 945, sometimes there's like the S&P global composite PMI and this type of stuff. The You'll notice nine times out of 10, the stock index is just chop around off the board. So from 9.30 till 10 a.m., it can seem very frustrating sometimes because they're not going anywhere. There's no follow through. They'll break, they'll break a low by a point and then reverse back into the range or whatever. The reason for that is because a bunch of people are just playing the bid and the offers. They're not committing because they don't want to commit before the number is released. Right. There's no point in that. And if you've ever watched the futures during an 830 AM Eastern 
number like uh, non-farm payrolls, GDP, uh, CPI, retail sales, durable goods. The book gets super thin because no one wants to commit to any size before the numbers released at 830, right? So a lot of newer people don't even know that. And they they put on a trade at 945 or 950, completely unaware that there's a 10 a.m. number that could spike the, you know, spike the indexes in a major way. So just being aware of those numbers and then keeping yourself out of trouble until after the numbers released is a major step in the right direction that a lot of people don't even understand. Yeah. No, no, very good point. Um, another thing you talked about wa was um, being selective about the situation and not necessarily, you know, selective about how many trades you're taking, but selective about the situation. And um, from your perspective, uh, having watched these products for so many years, do you categorize this when you're reading situations? Obviously, there's not, or I would say, in my opinion, not wholly unique situations every single day. Um, some version of maybe we could bucket these situations into maybe like, you know, five or 10 different situations that are usually happening. And then one kind of just who knows what's going on right now. Um, in your mind, do you kind of categorize it that way as, okay, I understand what this is. I've, I've seen this kind of action before, <laughs> or um, are you treating it kind of uniquely and reading each situation day to day? No, there, there, you can categorize it for sure. It's, it, it, it boils down to about, well, about five, like you mentioned. So, you either have a scenario that that should lead to or that could lead to good follow through. So a nice sustained run that where again, like everybody just starts going the same way at the same time, right? The market starts moving higher. The buyers buy more. New buyers come in. The shorts get squeezed. Not, not only do the shorts cover for a loss, but they also reverse and go long. And then this just creates a domino effect. So you have good, solid follow through. You have another situation where there's more volume on both sides. It tends to just sort of go ebb back and forth, but it ebb back, it ebbs back and forth in a fairly calm way, not super, super whipsaw nasty. But it, and and so that kind of a situation can sometimes be readable. Today would be one of those days. You have um, really nasty. Light volatile, uh, light volume, high volatility, back and forth action, which I avoid at all costs. Uh, it it usually just gets sliced and diced, and then typically you have like just sort of dead. They they tighten up and thousands are trading every couple of ticks. You know, no matter what product, well, you know, ES Treasury, whatever. Basically, the ES goes from trading 100 or 200 at every price to like five, 600 at every price practically. And that kind of kills the action. Um, not a lot you can do. There's not a lot of volatility there. And then you have the one that you're talking about, which is you turn on. Actually, again, like this last Friday and you know, some of this week, not today, but you know, it's rollover right now. So they're rolling from March to June. That can create sort of a situation sometimes where stuff goes haywire. Or you get a major news event, something like that, and you turn on the screen and just all the orders are, there's not very many there. And you just get sort of wild, crazy action, you know, which usually yeah. most people, they either get lucky and they hit it or they get annihilated. Those are kind of yeah. the, fate, I'd say the five. Yep. So, but mostly yeah. it's the four. It's like follow through. Of... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I would have a lot of just, exact ideas about this as well. And I think that this would get into erring on the side of trying to predict what's happening. Um, if we're in one of these situations and you're doing something different, you're not expecting the market to continue doing what it's doing. So maybe we are in some type of a not very volatile, but we're just holding on to a range and you're sitting there looking for a breakout that just isn't coming. That's kind right. of that you know, maybe more of that predicting something that there's no reason to expect this. Or if the market is, you know, having very nice follow through and you're just being contrarian to price for no reason, um, you know, predicting that it's going to reverse because it's gone up so far, uh, something along this line. But so much wisdom in, in being able to break this down because trading can be very chaotic, but there is order in this chaos. Part of the chaos is when we have a non, let's say, volatile type of balance day, there's a variety of ways that that could shape up. It's like a snowflake. Maybe we don't see the same exact thing every single time, but some version of the same thing. 
And when you can start to put together or at least be able to identify, you know, what is happening here? What is this, you know, what, what is this environment? Um, and then not do anything, you know, just expect the market to keep doing that until something changes that can massively clear up. I think a lot of confusion and save a lot of, you know, big time frustrations. Um, so thank you for explaining that part of it. Sure. Um, going back to, let's say, um, game theory. I know we kind of revisited some of the um, things that you had already said, maybe up until this point. And uh, I have a different way to to add on to this as well that I think we can talk about, but I didn't want to cut off if you wanted to elaborate any more or to, to take that any further. There's two things that I could just mention to maybe help people understand. Um, one is, again, like some of the reason you see the back and forth in the indexes, let's just say is because the spreads are very wide and most heavily weighted stocks. So a lot of people don't understand that. It's just something to, it's something to take into consideration. So so sometimes futures leads cash, sometimes cash leads futures, but a lot of the movement in NASDAQ and the, the Dow and the S&P is a result of the fact that you know Google and Amazon suddenly had trades go off and their, their bid ask is very wide. And so that can cause a quick spike of a couple ticks, you know, in the S and P or the Nasdaq. And then when it falls back in, it's because of you know a couple thousand shares of Apple and, and Microsoft trade. Let's just say. So when people are if they're if they're just watching the ES and they're trying to make sense of it, they mm. they don't understand that part of it, right? So it's actually pretty good if people can do it or if they're up to it, like getting a, a speed to some stocks and watching some of the most heavily weighted stocks alongside of your futures can be very enlightening. I would like to throw that out there. You, you'll start to see how the volume trading in the ES and the NASDAQ is also matching up somewhat with the volume trading in the major players, you know, and you can see where like heavy volume is suddenly trading in Microsoft and Apple and Meta. And then you notice that suddenly the ES and the NASDAQ both kind of stop you know, moving as well because they're, they're trading volume. Those stocks are trading volume. Um, and then the other one part of it is just keeping in mind that market makers, they do work both sides. And so when you're watching these stocks sometimes or these ETFs, what you'll notice is that there aren't a lot of shares trading. And then the futures are moving up and down like sort of, you know, a little bit of a range. And then let's say the, you know, the ES and the NASDAQ both kind of go up together and suddenly you see a wave of buy orders hit all the offers on all these ETFs and stocks. And within seconds of that happening, everything goes lower. And mm -hmm. it's because the, it's basically because the, the, again, the market makers, they can't do it all day, but in certain situations, mm -hmm. they push the futures just enough to trigger off these buy orders and the stocks and once all the offers are hit and all the stocks, they can flip and sell the futures and sell the stocks and try to create a pushback the other way and then make money on all the short trades they just initiated in the, in the stocks. Mm -hmm. And so the average person just watching the futures, you know, it doesn't make any sense until you think of it in that way. Like that, that makes a ton of sense once you understand that. It's like, oh, I see. They're, they're using leverage in the futures to push the futures a little bit and they're, they're already working all these offers in the stocks. And then when they get hit on all their offers in the stocks, they can use both ways leverage and start trying to press down. Yeah, it depends on the situation. But that's why you see a lot of back and forth, particularly like midday, um, unless it's an unusual day, but like middle day, 11.30 to 2 p.m.-ish. You, you'll notice the market tends to slow down quite a bit. And that's why. They're just working both sides and they're just hitting it back and forth, you know, and kind of yeah. assessing risk to not get run over, hopefully, you know, one of their trades. Um, yeah. But they're very good. They're very good at it. Like you said, in terms of somebody else having more, more skill, more information, everything else. They're very, very good at this. And so the, the average person needs to learn when to avoid that because you probably, whatever way you go, you're going to lose in those scenarios. Yeah. At least yeah, over the course of like a half hour, you know, to an hour, like you just, you're not going to pick that. Yeah, nothing there for you. And yeah. 
<clears throat> maybe to bring it home just a little bit, because I, I don't want anybody listening to this, just feel like maybe overwhelmed by it, because even the, the things you said right there, of that's kind of like just an additional thing now of, okay, now I need to be watching these, you know, right. <laughs> either correlating markets or some of these, these products. And um, this is, a, I think, a very beautiful thing about trading is that even what we're talking about here, um, there are things we have to know, there are things we have to figure out, but nobody is coming to save anybody. Nobody is nobody is going to, to gift you something magical that just makes your problems go away. And it really is up to you to find your path in this and to figure out like what can you wrap your mind around? What can you connect with? Um, what is your lane? And then you know find that as a base level and start there and, and have a framework for how you make sense of what is going on in the market and how you're 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 coming up with your likely situations. And then from there it's you know we build and we step and we 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 go and we go. And I think that there is this very exciting element about trading that somebody doesn't just give you the answer and all of a sudden you're just, you know, all your problems go away. A very interesting part of this job um, is starting from the dirt and not knowing what to do and have, you know, listening from other people and, and of course, learning from other people, but taking that and having the ability to make your own decision, because ultimately there's no way you can react the right way. There's no way you can make good decisions if you are solely relying on somebody else to try and just give it to you. And the process of figuring some of these things out where if it doesn't quite make sense, but you're you know you're kind of drawn to it intuitively of whatever I'm doing isn't working and I want to be able to make these better decisions and think discretionarily, um, that process of figuring that out for yourself and trialing and erring, I, I think is actually a bit of a necessary part of you developing yourself as a person, but as a, as a trader as well. Um, and I'm sure we'll circle around maybe some, uh, ho hopefully a little bit more, some very practical things that you can do other than the advice of, um, well, you got to just sit on the screen for years <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, because <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to hear that. No, 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 no. And of course, no, there's, you're, um, you're right. And I, and I you know, it, everybody has their own thing. I like with me personally, I, uh, I, I tend to just look for higher momentum follow-through situations uh anticipating those and then trying to catch the bounce afterwards like i'm fairly decent at that but uh, you know uh if it has been running I, you're right i don't just predict it stopping because i think oh it should stop now but i'm fairly good at like seeing the volume start to increase and then figuring out maybe they're going to back up a little bit not reverse but just back up enough to scalp because i'm also a scalper type scalp a few going back the other way uh you know i work with guys you're right though you show them some things like you can show five people the same stuff and then down the road you, you know one person is one or two people sit there and maybe only make five or six trades a week right waiting for like just exactly what they want to see which works for them which is fine and then somebody else who saw the same information is trading 15 times a day in a more volatile product but if he likes it because he likes the volatility, right? He wants to see more volatility. He's okay taking a bit more uh, drawdown, you know, um, percentage, let's say. And, but yeah, the fundamentals to wrap your head around would still be whether or not you want to be involved based on the movement itself. Um, high, a lot of it's high volume areas versus low volume areas. So if you want to talk about practicality, if you look at what I would recommend, certainly, A, would be to have an order book up. Um, there is a reason for that, like have the busy offers and then have the volume profile just for that day. So you, so that's the aggregate amount of volume at each price that trades throughout the day. And you'll notice that on most of the situations where there's like a quick follow through momentum situation that exists because there wasn't a lot of volume at those prices. So whereas right prior prior to maybe them reaching highs in the volume profile, you'll see 2,000, 3,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 in the volume profile. And then as they go, it may only take a few hundred contracts at six or seven prices to move the market. And that's why it goes so fast. And then they hit a bunch of volume again. See what I'm saying? So as a practical thing, you're trying to anticipate those moments when you don't think there's going to be as much volume at the next prices. And then if it hits a huge amount of volume um, and just seems to hit a wall, right? Just stops. 
there's not you may not want to fade it and go against a, like a heavy trend a one way street, but probably not a bad idea to just take your money and not not use a trailing stop and wait for it to roll back on you. That's a, a very practical. Not every situation, not every day, um, but in the in the days when there's follow through momentum breakouts, that's what you'll see quite a bit. You'll see pure areas of very light volume as they run an area. And then you'll see an, uh, another area of heavy volume develop. And then it usually chop, 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 right? And then you're trying to figure out, are they going to run again? Or are they going to reverse and get back down? And just kind of take it from there. And and uh, and then just get the feel for like pace. As far as at our contracts transacting every second, or are you are you watching the ES and literally you know 10, 20 seconds is elapsing before even five or six contracts trade? And that can happen again middle of the day. You're watching it and it's like there's a one lot, there's a five lot, and it takes forever. Versus in the beginning of the day, it's just thousands all over the place, right? Yeah. So if there's a lot of people playing in the game, a lot of contracts, you have more likelihood of some momentum follow through if there's very few people playing and it just seems to be a couple contracts executing every 10 seconds there's not really any point you're at the mercy of the, the market makers and probably as soon as you buy it'll go lower or as soon as you sell it'll go higher so yeah there's some practical stuff yeah very good um with saying a kind of in this i uh, i mean train that we're on right now that you started with thinking about the idea of game theory and specifically you know what is optimal um, I, I think a theory that's that's batted around and, and a, a, maybe maybe the biggest reason that traders aren't surviving um, and it's this concept of just minimizing the maximum loss. And um, as traders, going back to this idea that we're in a game um, that the person we're playing with at certain levels is just better than us, and losses are going to happen. And uh, if we are in a position to where um, we can lose a crushing amount, if that is a reality or if that is a possibility, then there's no way to make it in this business because eventually that is going to happen. And I think that for, you know, I can look at this through through my journey as well until I you know started realizing this at a, at a pretty deep level or at least a, a more uh, a level that influenced some actual change in my actions. Um, but I think anybody listening to this, if you just kind of tracked the times in your life, um, if you could eliminate completely the one-off days where you just pitulated or these small periods of time where you just completely unwound and did massive damage, if we could just eliminate these, those things completely, what a different landscape, what a different mindset, what a different you know reality your trading journey would be. And um, this idea of just eliminating those crushing losses uh, I don't know exactly why this feels very difficult to get our minds around. And I, I actually do have some ideas about why this happens. Um, but would you mind exploring this thought a little bit, me and kind of batting this idea around um, or, you know, maybe adding in if you think that there's something more important to talk about. Um, but this idea of losses are, we're, we're in a game where we, we have to understand that at some point we're going to be losing. And now, a very important part of this game is making sure that when those losses come, they are not brutal and they do not set us back farther than they should. Um, could we explore this topic a little bit? Of course. I'd say uh, based on my personal experience and working with other people, um, some of this is psychology. This would be where the psychology can come into play. Uh, so let's start there briefly. Um, a person has expectations. The expectations aren't met. There's disappointment. Disappointment leads to anger. Anger leads to bad decisions, right? And this is across life itself, right? You, whatever it might be, you go for the job interview, they don't hire you, you're angry, you go to the bar and drink a beer. I don't know, something like that, you know what I mean? So with trading, um, People get into it. They want to make money. They're expecting to make money. They think they can figure it out. They make some trades that don't work. They get angry. They want their money back right away. They keep making trades. So 
this is something that can be overcome for sure. Like this is a, a, a thing where you can learn discipline and be like, Oh, you know, like what you're doing now, you're learning more about how to be self-aware and um, not enter that mindset. Right. I, I get it. Totally get it. So totally worthwhile pursuit. So that's part of it. You need to just understand that. All right. You know, maybe the skill set's not there yet. Or again, maybe the conditions of the day aren't there. And I tell people like, if you've made four or five trades in a day and you're not up, probably it's just bad conditions. You know, like if you know, if you know something about what you're doing, so just unplug it. Just don't worry about it. Second issue, lack of bankroll. It's, it's, uh, most people kind of need to make money now. You know, they don't mm -hmm. actually have a bankroll for living and a bankroll for trading. They need to make their mortgage payments, their car payments, their health insurance payments. And so if they go a few days without making money, they feel like they're wasting their time. And so they're trying to force it again, right? You're not, they're not looking for the trade, they're looking for the money. I guess that would be the summary of it. So with one of the ways that you can avoid this is that stop stop looking for the trade and let the trade within itself to you. So the best trades are the complete no-brainers, as I call them. It's just everybody's buying. The market's going higher. Like yesterday, was like everybody's buying. So don't fight it. Don't step in front of the train. You know, if you if you want to do something, there's only one way to be sometimes. And and then you go with it and then you see what happens because it seems to be a pretty easy trade. The problem yeah. arises when guys do that and they catch the wave and it's great and, and they make money yesterday. And then they come in today and they're not they're not used to maybe a range thing or a slow day or whatever. And they want to do yesterday what they did yesterday. Right. So, and then they lose it all back, getting chopped up or whatever. I mean, maybe not, but you, you, you get my point. So, yeah. um, you, the brutal losses are usually a result of extreme lack of discipline for what it's worth. I mean, it, assuming again, you have the skill set, you have to circle back to the skill set. But let's say you've been doing all right month after month, for three or four months. And you're starting to notice that your drawdown is excessive. Probably there's something wrong. Like either maybe it's just you're getting angry at the screen or maybe something off in your life that can happen too. You know, uh, people go through personal issues and they keep trying to trade. They wake up not feeling well. They try to trade. On top of that, though, it's not just uh, the, the, the one or two days where you can throw it away. I mean, we talked about this in the last time too. A lot of it's just eliminated small losses that you know you shouldn't have taken in the first place. So yeah. maybe you're up five or 600. I, th I think you said this last time and you give back 200 and you're like, Oh, I'm still up 400 on day instead of 600. But you do that three times a week, that's 600 a week, right? Times 50 weeks, 30,000 a year. Now you're just, you're just giving it away for no reason whatever but let's say knowing that the action is slow it sucks you don't need to be involved but you want to cover your commission or something stupid like that right so you put on that one last trade to try to try to make your 100 new commissions back and instead you lose 200 right yeah. and then and it doesn't seem like much particularly if you're up that adds up in a huge way over time so yeah. just trying to eliminate one or two bad trades a week is uh, a big part of improving your bottom line. And then as far as the you know, losses. Just to add to that as well, because I, th I think this is a really important point where our memories are very bad about stuff. And we can make uh, a lot of very frivolous errors that we don't even necessarily remember. And we're not able to like compound those together to understand like what that actually did, especially if it's kind of hidden the fact like we're still green on the day. Um, and a lot of times there might be a, a, an issue, but the issue we're dealing with wasn't because of what happened today. Uh, it might've been all of these other errors that if we would have tightened those up, 
financially we've been in a better place, mentally we've been in a better place. And what happened today kind of unraveling, we wouldn't have felt that pressure, we wouldn't have felt certain needs or, or you know, whatever else. And, and kind of the surface thing happening today, that seems to trigger a lot. But, and we can't connect all the dots, but this path of just making little mistakes, giving back money for no reason in some of these situations, some of those sloppy behaviors, um, they can actually cause a lot of other problems down the road that we don't deal with and we can't ever connect that they're happening, but they, they happen. And it's, that's uh, it. it's like credit card debt, right? Like you have a mm -hmm. credit card that has a 10,000 limit on it and you put 50 bucks on here and a hundred bucks on there and 200 on there. And you don't really think much about it. You make the minimum payment or, and then six months later, you're like, how did I get 8,000 on this credit card? It's the same, yeah. same concept. So yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And something else I think, I've really, uh, I've really identified with this as well. I'd be interested in your thought with it because I think that there's a um, something flawed in the way that we learn stuff, and I think that we confuse the idea that we uh, we we know it and and we're good, and the difference maybe between learning something and really understanding something, and the difference just being if we go out there and no change happens in what our actions are. We, we might have learned it, but we, we don't understand what that topic is. Um, and going back to what you said about in the very beginning about taking things deeper, taking it from here to where we really understand it. And the idea of um, we all know, everybody knows that losses are going to happen. But if you go out there and you behave in a way like losses don't happen <laughs> or that you don't have to safeguard yourself against then and then you hear somebody say it again. You're like, oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Lots has happened. Well, you don't know. You know it, but you really need to know this as an idea because um, I've identified this in, in my own personal thing of just at, at a certain point, I really just did not accept the fact. I know losses happen, but I didn't accept the fact that the losses happen. And because of that, leave myself very susceptible to things getting out of control and things running very far against me and, and making a lot of you know really big errors. And um, th there's so something to be said about really kind of mulling over this idea and not just brushing it off. We're like, Hey, hey, hey Corpse, I get it. Losses happen. <laughs> do you really know losses happen? Are you fully aware losses happen? Like, do you really go out there and behave that I'm in a game where losses happen? And I think if you can bring yourself to that point and stay with that and, and use some repetition on that, that would also, um, clear up the way for maybe eliminating some of these big losses, because I, I, I truly, truly believe that this is one of the so much progress, I think, is being made at, for traders. They're they're learning things. They're they're building certain skills, but there's almost like this thing in the back of just like crushing losses that happen, or or you know, not eliminate, not making making that where that's still a possibility. And as much as you climb the ladder and as far as you go, it doesn't matter because if that's still a possibility, we're still going to be hitting these these awful things that just give us ma major major setbacks. Um, it's not a profit until you spend it is, is a lesson I learned a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not about how much you make. It's about how much you keep. Very wise woman told me that one time at rent a fund. And you have, here's what it is. You, you um, do you want to trade or do you want to make money? And if you, yeah. if your goal is to make money, then you should be making decisions based on making money as opposed to uh, playing a video game. And too too many people do approach understandably. I mean, the way it looks, it's like a video game. But too many people yeah. approach it as though it's a video game instead of a, a business. And you can't, I mean, you can re-up on credits, but credits is, is real money in this case. And so you have to, you know, your desire to be involved has to be less than your desire to make a profit year in it. That's really a yeah. big part. And yeah. after a while, I know people are like, I don't want to just sit there for a year, but after a while, you really, if you understand the game, I know how this is going to sound, but it's not that hard to see certain situations. Like if you're, if you're familiar with the markets and how they behave, sometimes fundamentally too, right? It's, it's something as simple as, there's trouble in the Middle East, price of oil is going higher, something like that, right? Like at, at least temporarily, just to say, as a as a play sometimes. That doesn't happen very often, but it's not that hard to see if you've been around for a while. And so a day trading, it's a similar thing. 
after you've been around for a while, it's like, oh, okay, that's not that hard to see. But waiting for those spots can be difficult, you know, and because you wake up, you want to be involved. Again, it's what you what you said earlier. It's really biological. You don't feel like, want to feel like you're wasting your time. And <clears throat> you have expectations to make money. And then the, the longer you go without making money, the more frustrated you get internally. And you're not viewing it as a as a business. You know, if you would if you're running a coffee shop and it's between the hours of 10 a.m. and noon, would you be frustrated because you're not getting much foot traffic? No, because that's normal, right? Like everybody comes in before work and everybody comes in at lunch. They don't come in at, you know, 10, 11 o'clock. Right? But because the screen's on and you have this video game you can play all day long, you just keep clicking the mouse and, and making those bad decisions, even though the trades aren't there. So that's, yeah. and as far as losses, I mean, yeah, it's, people think they're ready for it, but they're usually not. I mean, the first time they lose, uh, you know, a mortgage payment or, or months rent, I mean, it, it's hard. Like, what what am I doing? You know, it depends. Well, it goes both ways. That's one person. Then you have the other people who are professionals and it's the, kind of even crazier to me. Like somebody who spent 14 years in medical school will think nothing of like throwing up a thousand to trade with and he knows nothing about it. And then he loses 30 grand. And, and it's like, well, what did you expect? You know? And, and, and then, so it's two different worlds, but either way, mm. neither of them are happy. Uh, and until you've had that experience, it's, you can't really explain it. <laughs> it should, but you should know what you're getting into for sure. You should definitely sure. understand, but it is inevitable that some trades are going to be losers. And the trick is to try to recognize that as quickly as possible. You know, it's, if, if it's just obvious that you're sitting in a trade and it's not going, like, just don't hold on to it. Like you said, don't be married to it. Um, let it go and don't don't let the two or three point loss turn into a 10 point loss just because I think it's very important and, and you kind of you talk, you, talk, you said this and it, the idea of so easy to just get lost in the sauce of our trading and to forget you know to, to center ourselves on what we're doing here and to have the right idea and and then a couple days or a couple weeks can go by and we just start getting lost in the sauce and we start making incredibly weird decisions and doing incredibly weird things. And um, even to the point of forgetting that we're really here to eat what we kill and to make money. And instead we're, you know, off drifting around playing the video game and um, always coming back to center here, always moving back to reminding ourselves. And then this, this endless pursuit of understanding the game that's at play, that um, we are playing against people that are, you know, have a sense of humility of the game that we're in extremely difficult to do. Very few people can do this. It is possible, but we just need to, you know, don't get careless with it and and keep some of these I ideas in mind of building that skill and, and, you know, learning how to react in situations. And don't just think we're going to come in here pushing buttons and all of our problems are going to go away and we're going to make tons of money. But this is a skill. We can learn this. We can grow in it. We can do this for years and years and years. It's a worthy thing to pursue if you're about it and if you're up for it. Um, I know we're, we're past our time with it. There's probably a bunch of other topics I would love to just keep rambling on with you about, but I really want to thank you for the time and thank you for coming on and sure. uh, letting us have a, you know, a second around two here. Um, I'll say goodbye to you privately, but I'll give you just the, the last word. If there's anything specific you'd like to say or any thoughts or, or anything you'd like to say, feel free. And then we'll say goodbye here. Not really, man. Just, you know, I mean, it's, um, uh, got any questions on the website? Email me and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thanks for having me on again. It's been uh, been fun and yeah, we'll maybe we'll do it again next year or something. But uh, yeah, just fo focus I on the so. game. What I'd say, focus on the game. And, uh, not being married to trades. Awesome. Big thanks for coming on and yeah, uh, until next time. Take care, Aaron.